then. So um, we'll start start the meeting. Uh, I want to remind everybody and uh, uh, Dave, you might, if you knew people, just to remind people to identify themselves before they try to speak and um, whatever they have to say, keep it brief so we can get our meeting over with. And um, I would also just remind us one more time that we're doing this electronically with permission from the uh, with the new uh, legislation that the the Vermont uh, just passed, uh, I guess, about a month ago now. So we should be good to go. Um, I the first thing we should do is to uh, approve the minutes, which. Um, in my opinion, they are very good, very thorough, Mary, uh, Martha. Thank you. So, do I get a? I move to approve the minutes. Mary, Bill, minutes good. Can they hear us? I'll second it. About Phil, is he there somewhere? Bill, you're muted. <laughs> uh, I'm good with you, Gordon. Okay, good. Thank you. So we've all the minutes approved then. Okay, so do we have any, anything, any adjustments to the agenda, Dave? Uh, <clears throat> no adjustments. I just want to point out that on both the liquor licenses and the fire warden appointment, <clears throat> the select board, I'm going to need you to come into the building to sign. Yeah. Uh, we were able to get you out of it last week, our last meeting, but uh, this meeting, we're not going to be able to do that. So um, just know that between tomorrow and, say, Wednesday, if I can get you in to sign, that would be great. Okay. I was going to ask you about that. Good. Is that all of us, Dave? Or just Gordon? Uh, I think I need all of you for each. Okay. That's, this is Scott. It has to be a majority. So as long as four out of the eight of you guys come in, that's good. There's only five of us. Five of us. <laughs> well, so we need three. Yeah. Well, I'll go in. I'll be there. Yeah, I'll come. I'll, I think I'll be down tomorrow, Dave. I have to bring some papers into Martin anyway, so I'll come in. Okay. Um, David, can you conveniently put the agenda up in front of the screen for a couple of minutes? And I'll hold off sending that in until that's signed because I've got um, just the permission, personal record info right here. So I can give that to Mark. So there's a process. Just John and Scott, um, the rest of us are going to be able to hear you too if you have conversations just the same as you can hear each other. Um, just FYI, unless, you, unless you're able to mute yourselves in between. Okay. Gordon, you can go ahead. It'll take me a minute to pull this okay. up. Okay. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's open it up to any public comments that we have. If there are any questions that anyone has, for just a few minutes, and then we'll move along. I don't know who we have for the public, actually. Gordon, hi. This is Chuck Fenton. Hi, Chuck. I have a question. Go ahead. Governor Scott, in his press conference today, 
warned of an impending tsunami of property tax defaults in the coming fiscal year. But given Heartland's poor history of assessing for and collecting its own property taxes, I'm wondering how the town is preparing for this coming tsunami that the governor is warning of. Okay, well, I, I guess I would take issue with your uh, characterization of our poor uh, record in the past, but we are, get some information from Dave, but we, we are definitely on top of that and we are concerned about it. We have somewhat of a, a high delinquent tax at the moment. And I'm not, we, our budget is good. We are up to date with, with our finances so that we aren't in any, in any emergency situation. But um, it may be an issue, especially come September. So I think we are thinking about that. Dave, do you want to make any comments? Uh, yeah, I can. I'll, it's actually part of the, uh, the, the COVID-19 update, which is the next agenda item. So if Chuck can hold on a few extra seconds, I can, I can expand on that. Um, Thank you, Dave. We'll, we'll also talk about it a bit in the budget update as well. Thanks. Okay. Any, any other questions from anyone? Comments? Quiet, I guess. Okay, well, let's move along then. So we'll take up the first item of business then, Dave. Was uh, any update you've got on the, the COVID-19 uh, issues that are the latest things? Uh, yep. So few things, um, actually kind of a lot going on, very difficult to keep up with information. I was just chatting with Peter a couple of minutes ago before the meeting started about uh, how the information is kind of changing almost daily and depending on what agency or, or legislative branch is issuing the information, uh, it's tough to keep up with. But um, there is today, and I'm not sure what happened. I didn't see anything come out this afternoon on it, but uh, this goes to Chuck's question. And I did put some a little bit of info in the uh, select board packet for you to read as to what BLCT had kind of proposed for legislation. But Chuck, I'm not, I'm not in time. I'm not convinced that there's going to be a tsunami, a tsunami of um, delinquencies or or mispayments on property taxes. It'll be it'll kind of be remain to be seen. We don't collect taxes again until September. So it gives us several months to kind of see what's going to happen and, and see what moves forward. Woodstock has taxes due May 1st. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, but there, the legislators have been talking about allowing towns to um, basically uh, to, to do away with the 8% penalty on the taxes, uh, you know, which for us isn't, doesn't kick in until February, about 10 months away. So a lot can change between now and February. But the legislators are looking at giving towns the ability to make choices themselves as to whether they want to extend uh, or defer payment on property taxes, do away with that 8% penalty. Uh, there's also a discussion on um, the, the town payments to the schools because, you know, by law, we have to turn over the money to the schools, which is a whole lot more money than what we collect. We're only 80% of the budget. So if we have high delinquencies and we have to change over, turn over a significant amount of money to the schools um, and we don't have that, what does that look like? And who's going to borrow that money, the municipalities or the state? Uh, and then there's kind of a bigger question as to basically the state education fund itself, which at the moment is underfunded due to the lack of revenue coming in from rooms and meals and, and other in the sales tax. So there's kind of a snowball effect here. Uh, I don't know what happened to that legislation today, 
uh, as far as what they're going to allow the towns to do and what they're not going to do. We haven't talked about it much as a select board, but I think that um, you're right, Heartland has had uh, and the residences have had some difficulties uh, keeping up with delinquencies. For that matter alone, I would be very, very hesitant to change the dates that we collect or anything that we do. Just simply the, the inconsistency or the excuse um, or to open that door to allow for non-payment I think is is there's just too much leeway there and and can create uh, in itself in and of itself a reason to not pay. So uh, my recommendation would be to kind of stay the course. But we've got three to four months until the first payment, Chuck, and then a whole nother four to five months after that before we have the second payment. Uh, there could be some cash flow issues there. Things seem to be coming around a little bit. So I just think it's too early to tell how high or how low or what those delinquencies will look like. Um, I do know that we'll finish this year and we'll go through the budget later. We'll finish the budget this year fine. Uh, and again, we don't collect taxes again until September. So we'll see. Uh, that's the legislative aspect of what's going on at the moment. Um, FEMA, or let me take a step back, the state of Vermont did declare or have the president declare a national uh, or a presidential emergency for the state of Vermont. Uh, there was already a national emergency in place. Um, the state emergency or both of them allow the town and volunteer fire departments actually, John, I think you've been getting some of this communication to apply to FEMA for reimbursement of expenses. However, I've been watching this and the expenses or the reimbursement expenses seems to be fairly narrow. It seems to be for COVID-19 response only uh, and it's only for overtime. So think of setting up an emergency operations center. Think about the volunteer fire department buying PPE equipment, um, you know, other expenses such as that. That seems to be reimbursable. Um, and again, the overtime seems to be reimbursable. At the moment, I'm not seeing a need for Heartland to, um, to be involved in this at the moment. Uh, again, this is kind of weird. Usually you have, you know, you have like a storm and there's an event, you know the cost and you have like 30 days to kind of uh, submit an application. Uh, it's kind of, we don't have an end date yet. So that 30 days hasn't kicked in. Um, so I'm kind of playing a wait and see to see if we will need to make that kind of um, reactionary effort for COVID-19. At the moment, I'm not seeing it. So um, FEMA most likely will not pertain to us. That could change, but that's the way I see it now. <clears throat> uh, also, uh, we had, uh, or I had a meeting, um, Curtis was involved in this, Phil sat in. But um, we kind of pulled, for lack of a better term, the social agencies in town and, or the nonprofits and the churches. So the food bank, uh, the Heartland Mutual Aid, Aging and Heartland, the two churches. Um, North Heartland was not involved as far as the church. Um, Jeannie Frazier was involved. We just kind of chatted. We kind of had a get together, just kind of get caught up on who was doing what, what people were seeing. Um, two things kind of came out of that. One was um, Lucia Jackson and Ginny Frazier had some, um, they were a little bit worried about the aging population and being sheltered for such a long time. Uh, so there was some concern there. And then we got some things ironed out. Food Shelf put together a common phone number. Uh, so it makes it a little bit easier to get in touch with them. Um, and we move forward and we'll meet again uh, this upcoming Thursday too. Um, other than that, um, Curtis, I didn't chat with you beforehand, but uh, if you wanna add anything as far as mutual aid or, or what you see going on in town. Yeah, the yeah. Only thing I was gonna add was that um, Jeannie and I actually worked together over this last week on a list of the seniors who are over the age of 80 
So um, they have previously received a fruit basket through the Christmas project. Um, and she went through that list and she identified um, people that she thought may be uh, may benefit from reaching out a check-in call. And I was able to organize, we got 20 volunteers organized to call all of those people. Um, and I've heard back from a lot of the volunteers and about half of the the um, people they got in touch with said everything's totally fine don't worry about me no need to call me again and about half of them said yeah if you could call every week that would be really nice um, just to see how things are going so uh, we have a list now of about probably 40 people that spread across 20 volunteers will be getting check-in calls about once a week excellent um, well, if anybody has any questions, Gordon, that's all, that's what I've got at the moment. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a comment, I guess, about tax collection since how Chuck brought it up and talked about it. I think there, there are a lot of um, organizations or people who are competing for um, money. Everybody that everyone that has a credit card bill or a mortgage or whatever. And we have to, I think, stay the course of how we've been doing it. We're not going to be successful. They're going to pay some other bill instead. And I know that an 8% penalty missing your date by a day or a few minutes or whatever is very severe, but this is, it, it's, um, not something that isn't isn't avoidable, and so I just don't want I, I just don't want to think about doing something like that. In my opinion. And I would like to also um, support your position, Dave, and your opinion, um, Gordon, 100%. Because I think what I learned going through these uh, tax appeals is that a lot of people, at least, yeah. A lot uh, just pay the property taxes last, and that's not right. Okay. All right. Is that any any other comments? Move along. So, um, the appointment of the fire warden is the next thing on the list. And um, Dave, I'm not up to speed on that, but so maybe you can. I'm going to, uh, John, just this afternoon, and again, it's going to take me a little bit to get there, but I'm going to pull up um, what is a job description of this. And John, you can talk while I'm trying to fish for this here. So if you want to um, yes. give us a little bit of an update, and then I'll try and find, um, I'll try and find this. Okay, so um, everybody can hear me all right? Yes. Okay, so Mitch White has been our fire warden um, officially and unofficially for, uh, I don't know, 20 years, you know, something like that. And um, we, we share responsibilities in some regards, but officially with respect to the state, he is the, the person of point of contact for any um, open burning ordinance kind of related issues or forest fires in the town of Heartland. And um, Scott has been, I think at every wildland fire that we've had in Heartland, uh, especially he's been the incident commander at the big ones. Mitch has asked to step down about six months ago. He's kind of backed out of the fire department. I think his kids have all gone off to college, probably all back home now. But um, he is sort of uh, committed to his uh, professional firefighter career in Hartford. And um, we have we, he, he kind of left Heartland on very good terms, but wanted to resign as the fire warden. So we've been talking internally as a group about who would make a good fire warden. And um, Scott rose to the top of the list um, of our organization. And I'm here today to, um, to apply to the select board, who is the formal, because this is a state position, uh, the select board needs to back uh, his uh, sponsorship into the fire warden position. The major duties of the fire warden, I will read the bold print, but not the fine print. You can read the fine print later if you wish are threefold um, suppression of wildland fires within the town, 
is one. Number two is maintains records and submits reports. And number three is enforcement of forest, of forest fire open burning laws. And um, uh, yeah, and then there are three additional responsibilities, which are keeps informed and up to date by attending all training sessions, uh, maintains working relationship with the town officials and fire departments who provide fire protection, and maintains assigned equipment in good condition and uses equipment correctly. All the all the equipment that we'll be talking about is maintained by the fire department, but Scott oversees a large section of that and is sitting next to a box of forest fire hoses right now. So um, there, the last bullet on the first page is salary and compensation. Um, I'd love to joke with you and say this is a hundred thousand dollars a year, but um, no, historically the select board, I believe, has not paid Mitch anything, and that would continue. Um, I hope you're okay with that for our budget. And um, the he does receive a very small dose of like thirty bucks from the town or from the state rather for um, an annual um, <coughs> a couple annual per diem kind of things that he gets that that in total add up to less than a hundred bucks. Um, and he meets all of the qualifications. And we're basically coming to you as the, I'm coming to you as the fire chief of Heartland and saying I recommend Scott Bowers. And uh, we have a form here that needs to be signed by the select board chair and one, two, three, four other members according to the form. Oh, very good. It's a five year position. Um, I think we've just kept rolling Mitchell over without any sort of formality. So I think it, it sort of stays unless we need it's to change something else happens. Any questions or comments? Apparently not. Do we need to, do we need a motion on this or can we just come in and sign? I, uh, you should probably do a motion and put it in the minutes, Gordon. Okay. Okay. Well, I look for a, a motion then in a second. I'll make a motion that we support the uh, appointment of um, Scott as fire ward for the town of Hardin. Um This is Phil. I'll second second that motion to appoint Scott. Okay. That's okay. Let's get his last name in the minutes too. Scott Bowers. Scott, Scott E. Bowers. Okay. So everybody in favor of that? Yes. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks very much, Scott. Yeah. Yeah. With such a giant budget, I hope I hope to see great things. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think we're going to sign off. Um, I will. We'll do the secret handshake on the back door or <laughs> see if I can get this form in over at the town hall. Thank you, John. Yep. Thank you both. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you guys. Appreciate everything. Thank you, Scott. Maybe get Brad to help. <laughs> okay, bye guys. Okay. So that Everybody understands we need to come in and sign that this week sometime. Okay, next thing on the list is the road planning group. Um, accepting of the of the uh, written report and so forth. Bill, are you good on? Are you ready to? Uh, Gordon, I am. Um, <laughs> what I would like to do is just give a little. Uh, background uh, that we've already heard. Um, go through the core recommendations of the report. Um, and then uh, I have a couple of responses to issues that were brought up last time at our last meeting. And then uh, we'll open it up for a general discussion um, and hopefully uh, get a motion on the table so that we can approve the, and accept the report. Um, my first winter of being a select board member was filled with angry residents complaining about the potholes in front of Skunk Hollow Tavern and on the Brownsville Road in general. Um, I, one of my past colleagues and good friends, who's now the chair of the 
West Windsor Select Board um, turned off a Route 12 onto um, the Brownsville Road and proceeded to take out the front wheel of, his, of whatever they were driving. And um, his wife informed me that it was really pretty, pretty, pretty a good thing because they had dinner at Stone Hollow Tavern while they were waiting to get towed away. But he reminded me that that was a costly night for him. I think the hardest part of that time period uh, of the residents being really uh, upset was um, in behind Damon Hall, I witnessed uh, one of our colleagues um, berating Dave for not filling the potholes in front of Damon Hall. So I, I'm starting our discussion about the road committee and the report um, to say that um, the committee recognized that it was time to to change some things, um, and I think and I think I can, we we can address that. Um, throw in the angry residents uh, with the th throw together that with the uh, Two Rivers uh, road survey. Uh, and as we all know, the road survey came back like a Christmas tree lit up uh, with a lot of poor to fair uh, roads. So we certainly knew that we had the problem. And I think um, that it would be fair on my part to say that in the past we've been reactionary to, to the work. Whatever needs to be done, we would try to go out and fill that pothole, uh, grade that road but we did not have any sort of consistency in, in planning um, um, or, or monies to do anything. So I think the report represents um, a maintenance schedule that would be multi-year. It would allow us to catch up, uh, improve the town roads, and move to a more stable transportation system. So a quick review of what we're recommending. Um, We, we talked about the key components of the road, the ditching, the drainage culverts, the stream crossings, the hard pack, the paving, and the highway crew. Um, the report recommends a goal of 1.5 miles of ditching per year. Um, that's going to be a little bit short of the 19 miles over a five year period that need to be done to meet the state standards. Um, so we're hoping that uh, over over the, the next five years, we can actually get all 19 miles done. Um, drainage culverts. Um, the report highlights that we have 720 drainage culverts in town, um, and it rec furthermore recommends the replacement of 20 culverts per year. Um, the stream crossing culverts. Um, these are large capital expenses, much like what's going on in the four corners um, right now. And so the committee recommends the creation of a reserve fund to meet that. Um, hard pack for the dirt roads, gravel roads, recommend applying hard pack material yearly um, and stayed away from exactly how much, what quantity that means. Uh, and the paving, we recommend the paving of a mile or more per year. Um, and there's, I, I wanted to highlight something that Gordon brought to my attention. There's no new paving plan. This is all repaving of our existing roads. Uh, and the report recommends the addition of a highway crew member. And come this July, we have the budget for that. So, uh, Trying to, again, say at a summary level, um, I think these recommendations move the conversation from fixing potholes to planning uh, using a road asset management plan, which we talk about in the report, and that the committee believes that ultimately um, that this will be more efficient both for the physical roads as well as monetarily for the town. Uh, Curtis, you brought up a good point uh, and questions um, about the, um, the scope of the project and the scope of the report. Um, I, um, I, I feel I was fortunate to work with a very talented group of, of folks 
And we spent a great deal of time deliberating the, the scope of uh, your very question, Curtis. Uh, and the recommendations really represent what we think is a manageable scope for the highway crew over that over a period of time. Uh, and there's an assumption and certainly a hope that by the committee that the select board will revisit the plan and in, in three to five years to make see how it's working uh, and and make adjustments as needed. Um, Mary, you brought up the real issue of of cost and taxpayers being able to pay for it. Um, I think the report's recommendations really re represent the truer cost of the, a more truer cost of doing business than what we're doing today. Uh, and, and a truer cost of how we just maintain our transportation system. Um, by not doing this work, we're not making it more affordable for people to live here. We're simply deferring the needed work. And we're wasting our money, to be to be honest, in my opinion. Um, the more we defer, the more expensive it will be in, in uh, next year and the following years. And it's going to create more of a hardship for the taxpayers if we defer getting to this. Um, so essentially, it will be more expensive um should we defer acting on these recommendations um at the last select board meeting we talked about the fiscal aspects of it and i wasn't going to touch on that unless folks really wanted to um, it's really the recommendations that are key for uh, ourselves as the select board to sort of work on um, and I, I hope that the endorsement of the plan um, will allow us to get back on track and add some consistency to, to how we work on the roads. Um, and I really see this report as a roadmap toward reaching that consistency. Um, and as a little bonus, this plan also will allow us to meet the state standards which are, which are out there. Um, so those are my comments, and and um, like to open it up for discussion. Hey Dave, are, is the state going to give us any money to um, to reach those state standards? So right now, <clears throat> well, before the virus outbreak, there is money here and now. Um, you know what that looks like two, three, five, seven years from now. It's tough to say. I, I suspect it will dry up as if we go along here. And they just to, for instance, um, with the virus, um, they, the grants and aid project or, or funding is essentially on hold. Um, and that's understandable considering that the revenue stream, you know, that funds a lot of this is dried up. But I mean, that's just how susceptible we are. Mm -hmm. So the answer is yes, but I expect at some point that will dry up and they'll move on to something else. Okay, thanks. Um, both uh, Peter Gregory is out there in the audience and um, certainly Gordon was also on the committee. So I, I would ask if either of them had any comments that they would like to add. Uh, this is Peter. You know, I think you did a fine job, Phil, in kind of summarizing, you know, what the committee felt was um, necessary to get us kind of back on track. And I just want, from my own perspective, just give you uh, perhaps the Two Rivers um, viewpoint on, on this and then perhaps as a resident and taxpayer, my own thoughts. But, you know, a lot, of course, the new state law is driving this, but, uh, you know, we have a lot more rain events uh, it's kind of exposed the community, all the communities around here uh, in having some, you know, underperforming infrastructure, <laughs> small culverts, uh, improper ditching. Uh, so that's going to happen. Um, you know, so we've got these things that are already baked into the system. And then we had, we've had some intentional underfunding. This is, this is Peter, this is not Two Rivers, <laughs> underfunding of uh, the system. 
in in the state uh, in in this town, and it's really come home to roost. So when we have now these new state laws about water quality and roads and standards, culvert sizes, and then the the, the weather events, it's just you know, the perfect storm, as they say, it's just all come together. So as difficult as um, this problem is, I'm hopeful that we as a town can, um, you know, get on the right path as far as investment. Um, because as Phil said, as we all know, uh, deferred maintenance comes back to bite you. And it's gonna be more expensive for every single taxpayer in town. So um, anyway, good job, Phil. Gordon? Well, I, I don't have much to add. I. I... I thank you, Phil, for you. I know you put an awful lot of time into this, and I think you've done a great job. Um, I don't want to be too hard on previous uh, decisions or previous board members. Uh, Mary's been there right along. Uh, we've uh, tried not to overdo our budget, so I guess that may have resulted in a little bit too much thrift in some cases, but I don't think it's uh, too, too bad. But um, I highly endorse the recommendations of the of the committee. So hopefully we can move forward. So Phil, um, thanks for the summary again, and it really hit on some spots that were really nice. Um, and I can uh, spin a personal yarn as well. Uh, so I'm definitely not a prepper, but I like to be prepared. Um, so I'm really big on like, before I have a need come up, I find the solution to it and I find it when it's at a price that's where I want to spend it, at the price point where I want to spend it. So the other day, uh, or for months, I've been thinking about getting a KitchenAid and I reached out trying to get some used ones, all of these things, and they were just too expensive for me. And, but in the meantime, I'm buying cookies all the time, uh, for me and my girlfriend to be eating. And so I go to Mr. G's and I see this KitchenAid for $100. It's 50% off. It's already low price, $100. I'm like, bam, get that KitchenAid. So I didn't, this year, the KitchenAid and the cookies are going to be a wash. There was no money saved by doing that, but the outcome is so much better. Instead of getting these trash cookies from the supermarket, I'm getting these cookies that I get to make and I get to be in control of. I get to use my homemade butter to make these cookies. So the price is the same, but the outcome is so much better. And I think that's sort of what we're looking at with things, this whole deferred maintenance versus asset, asset management plan. So I'm totally on board with embracing the concept of an asset management plan in order to avoid the higher cost uh, per per unit distance of deferred maintenance. Um, the, the, the concern I stated, and possibly as Gordon alluded to in the last meeting, maybe this could be resolved by thinking about exactly how we accept this report, but the concern I was worried about is that the report sort of spells out the the, the minimal beginning to an asset management plan and doesn't explore to the fullest what an asset management plan, how that might benefit the town and the tax base that the town relies upon. So I'm fully supportive of the philosophy and the report. I think everything's really great in it. Um, and I hope that doing this doesn't mean we put it aside for three years or five years. I hope that if we're able to accept this report, that means we will continue thinking about how we can utilize this philosophy to give the town better results for the same or only marginally more money. That would be my hope. Yeah. Uh, well said, uh, Curtis. Um, the um, committee did look at uh, the road asset plan that VTrans uses, and we can all chuckle about the bottles on Route 5 and say, must be a great plan, huh? But um, they do have a comprehensive plan with uh, some basic road theory that's there. And I would really look toward Dave and um, our highway crew chief to, to come up to speed with that. Uh, certainly as a select board, we should monitor and see how we're doing. Uh, assessment is always important in any of these things. So. Um, 
I understand what you're saying that we don't spell out in detail the, uh, an actual Heartland Road asset management plan, but the philosophy is there for us to move forward. Yeah, and, and continuing to revisit that, not the town manager, yes, of course, and the, and the foreman and all of that, instituting the day-to-day -day work, but also us as a board from the policy level, I, it's, not my, it's not my favorite thing in the world to accept as policy, hoping that we will be able to get 19 miles done when we've only budgeted for 15. That's not like, that's not my favorite thing in the world, but I, I, I understand how starting it at this level is better than can it, having any sort of continued deferred maintenance. So Curtis, I wanted to uh, circle back to what you said that it would be the same amount of money but used differently if I understood what you were saying. So that was my personal story. I appreciate that this budget is larger than the previous budget, but what I'm saying is is the dollars that were spent in my in my life, the dollars that are spent, I'm able to get more value out of them by having yeah. this sort of perspective. I, I don't think that's uh, an appropriate analogy. I don't think it it's uh, relevant here. What this is asking, this report is talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars in addition to the current highway budget. And so, that's where I'm wondering where that money is going to come up. You know, if we had 80% of the tax money instead of the school having 80%, we could do all of this. But we don't. So we're still working on 20%. And yet we're going to have to, I guess, raise the tax rate a lot more to accomplish these goals. So, so I mean, funny, just Mary, curious. But Phil, Phil or Gordon or someone, could you clarify? I know in the last budget, we increased the budget even beyond this $225,500 or $225,000 that's in the report you sent around for the last meeting. So according to what I can see, the difference here is 260,000, but I recall that there was even an adjustment beyond that such that the difference ended up being 180,000 or something like that. Is that right? It's in the neighborhood of 160 to 180. Uh, 160. And, and I can ask Dave to step through that so that there's, there's no confusion on our parts. Um, I, I think I'll start by saying that um, we laid out a proposed budget of which was 485,000, but then we that was not in addition to the current budget that included the current budget. So that's that's you know like again I'll let ask Dave to sort of respond to that. Okay, I didn't understand that. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so. Uh, currently, uh, we spend about 200 and let me just get the exact numbers. I'm sorry, I was looking for something else as we were having this conversation. Um, prior to the highway person, we were spending about $225,000 uh, um, for the current assets in question here. And again, it's important to note that we picked five important key aspects of the road. Uh, and to bring those up to a, a, a level of, of quantity or, or quality uh, to get us to where we felt we needed to go, at least in the next 10 years, um, 10 to 15 years. With these budgetary numbers, um, the proposed number becomes 485. Shane, Shane, Dow. Dow. Is now joining. Um, because 485,000. Uh, that was about a $260,000 differential between when we started this conversation or when we were having this conversation um, today. This past March, we, we've already, the, 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 the interesting thing here is, is we've already implemented, I would say, maybe 40% of this. So just in March, we, we budgeted for the additional highway person and we added another $20,000 to the asphalt budget. Um, so if you take that away from the $260,000, the 225 to the 485 number that we needed to go, we get into that about $165,000 differential today 
um, and where we need to go with, you know, this full, you know, the full scenario of the recommendations. I should also add, though, and it, it's interesting because it seems to be kind of a compromise between Curtis and Mary here, but the report talks about instant or implementing this over a three to a four year period of time. Um, and that is to kind of step into this, Mary, to kind of understand that you can't just go from zero to 60 overnight. And the only other thing I would comment on, and, and this would be to Curtis a little bit, is that a lot of times when we have our select board meetings, you know, we kind of get fixated on one topic. So right now we're fixated on highway. Um, and it's easy for us to say, oh, heck, you know, 165 grand, we can, we can absorb that. But, you know, then we start talking about buildings and we kind of get lost in the buildings. And we, then we start talking about certain, you know, yeah, yeah. properties in town. And, and, you know, so when we look at things from a macro perspective and, and the multiple things that we need to take on, um, you know, I think that we're talking about over a few years to get from here to there. So, yep. Dave, I, I have some clarification questions based on what you just said um, from the highway expenses um, that you sent to us earlier. So you said you said that we've already started doing approximately forty percent of what's in the recommendation. However, in the highway expenses, to me it looks like we're at 63% spent of our budget. So are you saying we've increased our services in these areas by 40% yet we are still 40% below budget? So two different conversations. Um, so the percentage, so that's a year to date number when you look at the budget. Okay. So when I say we're about 40% there, so that 485, thousand dollar number so that's you know getting to a budgetary number of two hundred thousand dollars for asphalt a year it was only two years ago that we were at eighty thousand and today we're at 140. okay so or not today but as of july 1st we'll be at 140. so we went from 80 to 120 20 120 to 140 but we also had seventy five thousand for a new highway guy um, you know, we didn't really touch some of the other items. So we've already made some incremental changes in March of 2018. Uh, I'm sorry, March of 2019. And then again, this March 2020. And then we'll look to do so in the, in the upcoming years as well. So it's a matter of getting to, again, these final numbers um, on the ditching. We still need to come up like, you know, Twenty-five, thirty thousand uh, dollars. The culverts, we need to go an additional twenty-five thousand. The paving, we still need to go another sixty. So, but compared to where we were in March of two thousand and nineteen, we've already made, you know, incremental changes to get to where this plan proposes to go. That makes sense. Yeah. So I, I have a question. Now, now, taking the opposite direction, building off of what Mary is saying, is if we, let's say, doing this, proposing this increase in budget is going to facilitate us switching from a sort of reactionary to an asset management plan philosophy, does that mean we should expect these sorts of large increases to plateau after this three-year period? Or does switching to this asset management plan mean that we should expect the budget to continue growing at this rate? Um, Dave, I'll go out on a limb on this one. Um, you know, one of the things the committee sort of looked at, uh, and it was brought to our attention by uh, the presentation by, uh, by the VTRANS official that came down, was that if we can maintain our paved roads, we can get 15 years out of the life cycle of them. We will be spending money in between year zero and year 15, 
um, but it would be less than at the end of 15 years having to rebuild the roads, much like we're having to, like we just did with the Brownsville Road. So there is, in that planning, there is not a, there is a cost savings if we may do the maintenance. So I like your word plateau because that's what we're hoping that we'll have a more consistency and, uh, and, and given inflation, there'll always be the likelihood of increases, but we're not going to be talking about major increases at this point. Now, that said, uh, this report recognizes that there are some large scale road projects that are beyond the scope of this report, um, the Queechee Road. And uh, I think, you know, be straightforward with you, um, we can't meet that out of an, our normal roads budget if we repair that. That's going to be a separate issue. The board's going to have to work on that pretty hard. Um, but I do believe that we will have that plateau effect if, if we embrace this. Yeah, I think we should also remember, just like Phil just said, that there are a lot of unknowns in this whole scenario that we can't, uh, we don't have the most up-to-date crystal ball to see everything, but did the best we could. The plateau, the, the best in real dollars, that plateau ought to have a downward slope on the other side actually yeah. saving us some money if we do everything just right. And that, of course, is if everything stayed the same. But we have people building new houses and people with, with faster cars and um, people with higher expectations. And so it's not something we can absolutely uh, put our finger on. And the, the other aspect of that plateau is this Culvert Reserve Fund that we anticipate that coming out like that will that has a goal of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in reserve after which that won't be collected in such large chunks anymore is that correct well if we spend it we might have to replace it sure <laughs> I yeah don't know. yeah yeah that's the initial startup on that fund will be much higher than once we get to the 250 number um correct yeah. Um, if there's no additional discussion, I would like to offer a motion. Hearing uh, none, I would go ahead. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion to move to accept the recommendations of the Heartland Road Planning Committee report dated April 20th, 2020. Um, I just had to insert that April 20th, 2020. Okay. And to implement these recommendations, and furthermore, to use the recommendations as a guide to the creation of a road asset management plan for additional maintenance and road planning activities in accordance with state water standards. Um, Martha, I can send this to you. Uh, <laughs> let me read it quickly again. I'd like to make a motion to move to accept the recommendations of the Heartland Road Planning Committee report and to implement these recommendations and furthermore to use the recommendations as a guide to the creation of a road asset management plan for additional maintenance and road planning activities in accordance with state water standards. Can I ask about that last clause? <coughs> in Accordance with state water, water standards. standards. Why is that? Why is that the way? The whole guiding point for our asset management plan seems narrowly constrained. Um, uh, it was it was added as another guideline that we need to follow the emerging standards, uh, which are are referenced in the report. So it's really not the road asset management plan. It's it's a part of. Maybe it's just in accordance makes it seem like that's the whole guiding, but that might be too nitpicky. 
<laughs> ignore me. Yeah, I think it is. But that uh, the origin of that is uh, pollution in Lake Champlain and pollution in the Connecticut River, and it's not just town roads. It's everything that farmers do when people build um, malls and big parking lots. Uh, it's everything that's happening in the state that has to do with what happens when it rains hard and the water runs down down our slopes. So, and roads are part of it. So My I'll, I'll second that motion, but I would like you to include, um, Phil, something about as presented on April 6th, 2020, because that's when you presented it originally. I'm not sure why you want to date it today, but it's- I, um, I, um, the, Go ahead, Mary, I'm sorry. Well, I just want, I think it's helpful to have a, a date so that it can be referenced in case another one of these reports shows up sometime. It's important to have a date on it. Right. Uh, I made one very subtle change to the report today. Oh, okay. I should have, should have made for the April 6th meeting. Um, okay. And Dave's laughing because I asked him whether or not I should change the date or not. Um, in the recommendation for paving, I added a phrase that to clarify that we were talking about existing paved roads and not new paved roads. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, so as presented, I guess today, yeah. So uh, uh, regarding regarding the motion, I wonder I wonder if this might be a good opportunity to, instead of relying on a state uh, unfunded uh, imposition, if maybe this might be a good opportunity to reference a local, locally voted, approved by the voters of the town of Heartland um, measure by instead of referencing the Vermont water, whatever, we could reference Article 12 as voted by the citizens of Heartland. Article 12 from this previous town meeting? Yeah. But that's disingenuous because that's not why we're doing this. Okay. I mean, right? We're not doing it for that reason. This was started last, a year ago. Mm -hmm. Way before this. I mean, it's nice that it falls in line with it, but that's just serendipity. Yeah, these mandates do in fact come down from the state. So I think that's... That's our, our guiding, our guiding, um, what about something in, behind it? Yeah. What about something in alignment with Article 12 or, or, or something like that? And why is this important? I, I was just listening to Gordon talk about pollution and all of the effects that we have on the environment. And I was thinking that we actually have something that was started by people in town and approved by the voters in town that has as its goal and as its focus things like pollution, environmental pollution. And that might be a good way of incorporating that. Right. Uh, Curtis, I, I, um, I, I, I think that's an excellent idea, but um, Article 12 has no substance to it, whereas the we have a clear mandates spelled out in, in, in the various state laws um, with dates. And that's what we're really, what's really guiding us here. Um, and I think the byproduct right. is that we're going to have uh, a better environment uh, and a better transportation system um, for, for the town. Right, so what, what I, I recognize that that's correct, and so my, what I initially said of getting rid of the whole Vermont water plan thing, I, I removed that suggestion, and instead I, I was recommending keeping that, and then maybe also adding and in alignment with or something something like to that effect. Right, but again, I I, I would ask you to show me what we are aligning with. Uh, Article 12 is an abstract. Um, and, and I don't think we can create a planning process that is is based on an abstract. I've written lots of papers that, that were based on abstracts 
originally. Uh, but but I, I I I see I see what you're saying, Mary, about it being disingenuous as it wasn't part of the initial process. And I see what you're saying, Phil, uh, of it not really holding much substance. And that that makes total sense to me. It's not super important to me that this gets in it. But I think that that uh, I maybe this is just an opportunity to say like as we develop things like this, we can start to think about them uh, in the light of Article 12 or or something like that. So not just constrained to the state imposed mandates, but also uh, incorporating what the town has voted on. That's that's that that would be I have now removed all of my recommendations and I have reduced it just to a suggestion going forward. <laughs> OK. Uh, Martha, we haven't heard anything from you. Have you got any comments? Um, well, I was muted. I think uh, keeping this separate from Article 12 is what we should do. I uh, also wondered if uh, the re slightly revised edition of the report would will be available for regular people to read. And I also would appreciate the exact wording of the motion, Phil. I got. Okay, so a couple of things there, Martha. Um, uh, I think the committee and hence now the select board are still needs to meet. It's one of its last mandates of having a, some sort of public meeting to, to talk about this. Um, and we haven't addressed that yet. Um, we were we had hope for maybe one of the community breakfasts, but who knows when and if they'll start again. Um, so, uh, and I'll certainly send you the the text of, of my motion here. Um, and I forget what the first one was. Um, anyway, there's two out of three. So, yeah. so did we get a second on this? Mary, Mary seconded. Okay. I second it, yes. Any further discussion? Are we ready to go? Mm -hmm. I say yes. I say yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I say yes also. OK, so unanimous then. So we have an accepted report <laughs> for whatever that's worth. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank and you, Phil. Should I Thank put you. in the minutes that a public meeting will be forthcoming at some point? Or how, how should I just? Leave that up in the air. Uh, I think you could mention it, but I wouldn't promise it at okay. this point. I think we should do it. I def it was definitely part of our plan. Well, Gordon, um, if the town has the license to Zoom, I believe it can uh, get as many as 100 people in on a meeting. So we could have a public meeting. That would be awkward as all get out, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, this is on Teach, right? Or team, Teams. Oh, yeah. Dave, do we have Zoom, too, or no? Yeah, but I'll one-up you, Mary. We can do 250. Oh! Wow! <clears throat> how many I people we do we try. have? Dave, how many people do we have at this meeting right now? My number says nine. That includes all of us. Thirteen. Right? There's 13 right now. Oh, my number is not isn't right. OK. I don't know why mine says plus nine. OK. I think getting 250 would be quite something. <laughs> OK. All right. Any further discussion on this as we move along? OK. So we want to talk about the budget update, Dave. Okay. Discussion. Two minutes. <clears throat> so it's been a little bit since we uh, discussed this last time. The meeting went pretty long, and we you got the handouts, but we didn't really do uh, a verbal update on it. Um, and I think we may even have skipped over some some questions on it. But in a nutshell, at the moment, the budget looks pretty good. Uh, remember. Uh, the expenses and the revenues are a little skewed uh, on both sides of the, the ledger. 
we sold the 21 house. So you have um, a disproportionate number for expenses and revenues. Uh, obviously the revenues is from the sale of the house. Um, and on the expense side and the sale of the house, um, you'll see in the, the last um, item on the general fund revenues before you get to the recreation center, it's the 166,226.97. Um, and then on the expense side, uh, it is found under the assessment. And uh, you'll see at the bottom of the assessment, you'll see 149,580. So the expense side is when we paid off the loans. So you've got revenues and expenses. So if you just simply look at the last, you know, how did I do in the general fund, you know, and you just look at the very last number, it's going to be skewed because of those two numbers, both on the revenues and expenses. Um, that being said, we are just, uh, you know, on budget for expenses. Um, most of the departments are uh, running under budget. And again, we're not, we're not doing anything. Um, we're basically keeping the lights on um, on the expense side. Also, um, this will be a benefit, um, but you know, I'm not sure it's a good benefit, and it remains to be seen. Uh, I'll need to touch base with Dave Jocelyn again. But what could help us with the budget going into uh, the end of this year? just simply, um, you know, because of the unknown is that we haven't done the front steps of the rec center yet. And that's a $35,000 expense. Um, if the opportunity presents itself, I think that uh, the recommendation is, is that you go ahead and do it. Uh, Cause we do have, um, you know, the, the budget is trucking along and we're doing pretty good from a budget perspective. Um, but if it doesn't happen, it's just something that helps us, through the summertime going into September, as far as, you know, ending this budget year and, and the overall, you know, balance sheet, if you will. Um, on the revenue side, uh, I'm just taking a quick look um, to make sure that there, I'm not missing something else on the expenses before I get too far into it. Uh, on the revenue side, uh, we are expecting, if you look at the, the property taxes, it looks like we're off $115,000. Uh, that's not the case. We're waiting for um, essentially what the state does is consistently throughout the year, uh, property tax rebates kind of go out. Uh, so if you are late processing your taxes, what happens is, and you're going to get if you do your taxes late, you're going to get your regularly tax bill. If you then do your taxes in August, September, or early October, and you get a, a basically a rebate or a prebate on your taxes for your property taxes, the town has to adjust for that. So we have to send out a whole new property tax bill. And um, it may be for less than what it was originally billed for. And they're going to pay that lesser amount. The difference is made up by the state uh, and we they kind of true that up. Actually, it should be happening any day now, but they true it up in April. Uh, so the differential that you see on the property taxes, a big part of that is because we're waiting for that payment to come back from the state of Vermont. Uh, Phil, you asked about the rec center last meeting. Uh, at the moment, um, you know, as I mentioned, the revenues and expenses are kind of offsetting each other. Um, we don't, we've had to give back, uh, and it's in our warrants today. We had to give back some credits um, to people that had registered for programs. Uh, however, that loss of revenue is essentially offset by the fact that we don't have any, you know, we don't have 12 part time employees for the after school program, or, you know, we're not driving the vans around. April vacations coming up. We don't have any of those programs that so we're not expending any money. Well, looking over the budget, there is one differential and it'll, it'll create a budgetary problem for the rec center. Again, I think we can overcome it, but the summer camp 
we get the fiscal year is kind of split right in the summer camp. So basically people start signing up in May and June. Uh, and so we usually see a real bump in revenues for summer camp now to June 30th. And then, you know, they're, they're basically booked and they're registered and we get a little bit of revenue, you know, in July and August. But all our expenses happen in July and August because that's when we're actually running the programs. So for this fiscal year, which starts July 1st, the revenues haven't really come in yet. They come in May and June, but we've already gone through July and August of 2019, which is part of this fiscal year. So we may see a revenue shortfall on the summer camp programs simply because I don't know how many people will be signing up for summer camp with a really big unknown as to whether they can even go or not. Um, so we may see a differential there. I think it's like maybe 15 grand, 20 grand, um, but that will affect the rec center budget to a degree. Um, but again, if we don't have any rec programs, the fiscal year budget 21, of which July and August will fall into, expenses will be really small. So it's a possible that we see kind of an inverse of that situation next year, where a year from now things get back to normal. We didn't have any expenses in July and August, and all of a sudden we have high revenues in, in May or June. So just know that that may occur and most likely will occur. Um, highway budget is um, also looking good. Uh, just uh, and again, the highway budget is somewhat skewed because we don't plan if uh, this is before Curtis's time. But uh, we did essentially when we did Brownsville Road, it was uh, basically two years worth of uh, or two budget years of, of paving. Uh, we didn't want to bring them back, you know, have them there in May and come back in July to do it. So in order to make up for that, we're trying not to, to pave uh, until July 1st, which would mean that that money that we earmarked for paving kind of makes up for last year where we overspent then we underspend this year and then we kind of get back to normal. Uh, so <clears throat> you really kind of need to look at that and factor that in when you look at the highway budget uh, and the fact that um, there's a good $100,000 uh, that has not been spent for paving to date. Um, otherwise, <clears throat> on a more macro perspective, when it comes to the highway, um, for an individual line item, we're a little bit overspent on stone. Uh, but if you look on the revenue side, uh, we do have $31,000, $31,700 that we have for grants and aid revenue. So most of that stone was spent on, um, on Mace Hill when we did the uh, Mace Hill ditching project which is essentially taken care of in that revenue side. Um, so that's an overage I'm not overly concerned about. Um, we are spending uh, the budgeted amount on hard pack. Uh, we laid a lot of that down in the springtime. Um, and on the winter, uh, the labor is a little bit over budget. Um, but um, that is offset, or, or let me put it another way, the overtime is over budget, but that's kind of offset on the actual labor expenses is, is under. Uh, and the salt is way over, so we did have an overage on the salt. Um, the other thing I will point out, of which I pointed out to Bill, uh, and this is an important line item for you guys to kind of keep track of, uh, under equipment, which is still under, uh, you got summer maintenance, then gravel resurfacing, uh, and then you're gonna have equipment. Um, it's kind of a crapshoot. We've only been doing this for about two years. Um, the amount that we spend operationally on the trucks, the maintenance and the supplies and et cetera, um, that's important to watch because what we really wanna do is try to preserve that 143,676 we want to preserve that money to go to the equipment fund. Uh, and it does go to an equipment fund. The equipment fund's actually there. Um, so if we overspend on the 
equipment maintenance, uh, it eats into that money that we put into the reserve fund. Uh, and we had about $20,000 left to go um, until June 30th. Um, so not a bad number to have, but um, truck three, which is our six wheeler, um, did go to the shop and is posing some problems. So we've got that coming up as well. But just to Dave, is that the one with the $11 seal that cost $2,500 to install? The which? I saw an $11 seal. It cost 2000 something to install somewhere in here. Uh, <laughs> close, but that's not actually what happened. But um, okay. <laughs> uh, that's about 14. So that, that one with the $2,500 worth of work is the one, if you recall, we've got another six wheeler that's a, actually a four wheel drive vehicle. Uh, we use it up on Cream Pot and, and Densmore in that area. You recall like two winters ago or a winter and a half ago where we had the front axle problem. Uh, so that's the continuous maintenance on that truck. Um, so that one's kind of, um, you know, is, is going to see some yearly maintenance on that axle that will be somewhat expensive. Uh, so that's the truck that you sell the $25 worth of, $2,500 worth of work. Uh, however, on the good news, on the good side of this, uh, we do have the 31,735 uh, the grants and aid revenue. Um, about 15,000 that we spent the year before. Um, so that's again, kind of a, a balancing act there. Um, we also had 11,800 from the um, um, storm uh, FEMA money come back to us. And I'm expecting another 30 grand maybe to come back to us from that April 15th uh, project. I do expect that it may come in before the June 30th um, end of the year, uh, which would be nice to have. But again, that'll kind of cushion the highway budget. But um, both budgets at the moment are in fairly good shape. Um, um, you know, I, I don't have, you know, it's, it's, better than the last couple of years. Okay. Dave, I had a question on the accounts payable, which by the way, we may want to make a motion for. Um, there are a number of checks that are going out for uh, after school program, I think most of them are, adult <laughs> programs, youth programs, after school programs. These are reimbursements. Are these, yep. are these, um, are these people that are still on the payroll, even though they're not necessarily being used, or or are these back bills? Uh, no, uh, Curtis had it right. So that's us. Those are people that have pre-registered for programs, um, and we have the programs are non-existent at this point in time. So it's money back to. Oh, I see. You're reimbursing. It's actually back to residents. Um, you know, some are for not a whole lot, and then there's another one that, you know, she okay. signed up for just about everything, so that's what that is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> about, the rec, about the rec center, so um, I, I guess I, I'm not totally clear on how revenue neutral we expect the rec center to be. So it looks like the discrepancy between the rec center budget and its revenue was about $120,000, right? <clears throat> that was the expectation. Uh, so sorry, I'm we'll, looking at these sheets. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just trying to, I, I'm trying to, uh, I just want to make sure I understand the question correctly. So, and we we bring this up almost every budget year. Um, so, my understanding of Heartland's policy has been that the 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 programs essentially pay for themselves. The town pays for the rec pro the program director and half of the assistant director. School pays for the other half. Okay. So um, that amount which also includes health insurance, but basically the director and, and the assistant director is picked up by the town. The rest of it's covered by 
you know, program fees that should offset the program expenses. Okay. So we're right now, the difference between those two is $80,000 and you, we don't expect the revenues to grow at all through the rest of the fiscal year. Most likely we won't, they won't grow very much, let's say. Um, but the expenses will keep pace or how much lower do we expect the expenses to be because of that? I guess I'm wondering what 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 shortfall are we looking at beyond the pre-budgeted 120,000 in your estimation? Uh, so I to tell you the truth, Curtis, I didn't take a look at that. Uh, other than that, the revenues at the moment we're running ahead of um, the expenses um, without the the program director in there, um, and I feel. I, I'd have to call you tomorrow and let you know, um, to be honest with you. Um, other than the fact that I feel very comfortable at the moment that that's about where we'll end up. Um, the only wild card here is what I pointed out uh, with Phil is what could um, harm that is that the summer camp revenues, uh, the split in the year being the July 1st, fiscal year and that's exactly you know you know we've accumulated the money and then you know camp starts so with this fiscal year we've already had those expenses and most likely we won't see that revenue so if there's a shortfall i think that's where it'll be at um however i feel comfortable enough with the rest of the general fund that you know i'm not i, I feel comfortable enough with the rest of the budget that that can be managed okay um and with regards to the entirety of the general fund, um, at, we're, we're going to talk about this correspondence that you sent from Karen, no, from what's his name? Aaron Frank. Uh, and one of the things that Aaron Frank has a very dire perspective on our ability to collect taxes this year. And I understand you don't share that same perspective, but one of the things he talks about in this letter is about intentionally limiting expenses in anticipation of a budgetary shortfall. Is that anything we're thinking about doing or do we have any wiggle room or what do we have any potential for that or should we be worried about it? So I'm, I can't answer that yet, Curtis. So you got to understand kind of where we are at um, budget wise. So this budget is coming to an end. We've collected the taxes on it and um, revenues and expenses overall, I'm, I'm somewhat comfortable with. Um, and I will get into another subject in a minute. Um, the next fiscal year starts in July. So you'd be sitting, you know, we'd be sitting here saying, okay, you know, what do we want to cut back on going into July? Um, I, you know, that's just too. It's just too much, you know, I'm really focused on May 15th right now is kind of where my head is. You know, what's the governor in the, you know, what one, what's Trump going to say about his May 1st deadline? What's, you know, Governor Scott going to say about May 15th? Um, he's already made a very, very, very slight movement as of today, uh, allowing independent contractors uh, with one or two people back to work. Um, and we seem to be leveling off. So I'm really waiting to see what May 15th brings and and what is allowed to reopen and what's not and whether this comes back before I hit the panic button too much and say, oh my God, we got to stop everything. Okay. Um, and I'll be honest with you, <laughs> we, we don't really have a whole lot to cut. Um, I would not recommend cutting the, the paving that we've got coming up. Um, you know, we're going to need a new piece of equipment um you know we have a whole separate equipment fund for that or it's going to be a, a municipal lease so i wouldn't touch that you know we could put off for a couple of months hiring the highway guy to see what happens you know whether you know we're still in dire shape september um i'm just you know when my answer to that would be let's get to you know june 1st and let's you know take that kind of one step at a time but for this year's budget I don't, we're, we're comfortable. 
um, in next year's budget, I think it's just too soon to be too soon to be had. So let me just add to this, though. So, and in municipal government, you know, accounting is kind of you know what you raise and your expenses, is, and it's kind of a one-year snapshot. So when you bridge the two, uh, when you when you look at this cumulatively, um, you know, we ended up after last year, June 30th of 2019, with a small surplus, like 30 grand. Uh, and I just did some quick math and, and don't hold me too much to it, but things kind of went as it was, you know, the general fund could end up with another 15 to a $30,000 surplus again this year. So cumulatively, you sit there and say, okay, that's 60 grand thereabouts that may swing to a surplus. The wild card here is in the delinquent taxes. So um, at this moment, we do have roughly $250,000 in delinquent taxes. Uh, I think the cash flow is fine till September. Um, you know, and again, hopefully, you know, there's not too much of a hiccup there, Curtis, come September. But from now until September, I think we look good. Um, from a balance sheet perspective, what helped swing us to a surplus last year is that we were able to close the gap on those delinquent taxes. So we went from like 250,000 down to like 75,000 by, by the end of August. And we do have a 60 day window to kind of claw that back into the fiscal year, the end of June 30th. We have a 60 day window there. Um, so we were able to drive the delinquencies down there's a question mark, and I spoke to Gordon a little bit about this, and I it would mirror my comments from before. If given the opportunity, I would look towards consistency and holding another delinquent tax sale again. You know, we held it middle of August last year. I would shoot for that again. Just know that whether we want to or we or or not, at the moment we're restricted by doing that by the state, by various orders from the governor, one of which can't have more than 10 people conjugate in a room. Uh, so <clears throat> may or may not be able to carry that out um, in a timely manner. Again, May 15th will be, I spoke to uh, Kevin O'Toole today, who is the uh, lawyer that helps us with this. And we were like, yep, let's keep that date kind of in mind. but. We will talk again around May 15th and see, or earlier, depending on what the governor does and doesn't do. So the next six weeks will be interesting and will tell us a lot about where we're going on the summertime. And my last question about the budget was, uh, and this is just because I don't know anything, um, what is Western Star Loan? So the Western Star loan is actually done at this point. Um, it was a uh, Western Star is one of our uh, dump trucks. It's one of our 10 wheel dump trucks and um, or maybe it's the, the four, four wheel drive one. Um, but that was a five year municipal lease and that uh, expired just we made the last payment on that. So that's what yeah. that is. I was I was wonder I was wondering why if it was a loan our budgetary and our act our budgeted and actual expenses were different that seems like something we should have known <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think it's a small amount. Um, yes. you, you know I think uh, you know we have like a little um, uh, a little you know thing that tells us um, there may have been. Um, and again, let me just take a look at it. Whether it was like an administrative closeout cost or whether it was less than what we were expecting um, just because of the date that we paid it or whatever, I can't I can't answer it, but um, you know, it's not anything too far out there. Okay, that's it for me. Dave, I have a, I think a straightforward, easy question on the general fund revenue side. Yeah. We are have this stellar interest that's coming in on the investments, yeah. and we know the markets have sort of crashed. So I'm not sure. Just want to know 
or ask how safe that money is right now. Is it has has um, yeah. I don't it know is, kind of it is, it is as good as our friends over at uh, the bank across the street will um, will be good. So that's just basically a general savings account. Um, mm -hmm. I think we've had a conversation on this in the past uh, where um, it is uh, it, it's an. I'll try and keep this out of the weeds, but um, it allows us to pool all our money in one place uh, and still be safeguarded by the FDIC $500,000 uh, amount. So it kind of spreads the money out in, in different tools or, or locations for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. uh, so therefore it is um, insured, but based upon um, the amount of money and the the, the, the tool that they use, it's a higher percentage. Um, you know, it's not like a 6% interest, you know, type thing. But right. for savings accounts, it's the same or if not better than a CD. And um, it allows us to kind of bat our cash flow back and forth depending on our needs. Um, so it's not, it's not tied up like a CD where you can't get to it until September of 2021 or 2020 or whatever. We have access to it, but we certainly try and keep as much money in that part of the savings account, per se, uh, as we can so that that amount gets the higher interest rate. And then we just kind of pull it over as our cash flow, okay. you know, as our needs, or we push it back depending on, you know, what we've had for, for money coming in. Okay. okay. Thank you for the refresher. You, did, you have talked about that in the past. So, yeah. So, does anyone else have any budget questions? Not for Mary. I do have a question. These are very small things, but they uh, piqued my curiosity. So, we have to pay uh, art lines. Um, Dave, you can stop smirking. I was waiting for you to say something about the constable budget, but uh, anyway. No, no. Okay. No, this is even smaller than this. This is okay. so such minutia. We pay two hundred sixty-four dollars for three weeks of trash removal. Am I right? Uh, I don't have it in front of me. It's it was on the warrant today. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm not. I can't remember the time span. It um, said April yeah. 1st to April 20th, but that might just be, I don't know, your check writing period or whatever. Okay. That seems exorbitant. Uh, but it is for all the buildings. So uh, I think that that incorporates, um, and you'd have to, I'd have to maybe pull Tom in for a moment, but um, that may or may not include the Saturday morning um, fast trash. And, um, you know, we've also got trash over at the highway building. Um, we've got trash, you know, in other locations. So, um, wait, there should not be a charge for fast trash. We're not paying art for fast trash. Then it's just pulling out of the, um, the building, pulling out of the, the dumpster, Mary, over at the highway garage. And is it weekly? It's, it, does he service those weekly? I'd have to get back to you, Mary, and, and look into that deeper for you. Okay, Dave. This is a very important issue. What's that? I said this is a very important issue, Dave. I hope you get I, right I, on I, it. it. Well, you know what the cost is, Mary? It's on all that recycling crud that we can't get rid of. What are you, you know? <laughs> what are you gonna? What are you gonna help us out on that? Dave, I have hey, another Mary. question that has to do with disposal, and it's doggy doo-doo uh, bags for $400. What the heck is that? So you can walk your dog. $400 for plastic bags? You know, I, again, I'll have to talk to John, but um, you know, we put it out in three different places. Yeah, see that. Um, you know, we put it out at the fields. We, we don't order from them every week. 
uh, you know, we, we order it and we have it in inventory and then we go through for several months. So, um, what do people do with those bags? Where do they dump them? Well, that could be because why our waste expenses are so high, Mary. <laughs> they Help us the art lions. <laughs> they put it in the trash. So okay, all right. It's a vicious, it's a vicious I cycle. Thought about the trash yeah. in a long time, Mary. I'll, I'll have to. I'll have to check with Bill on that on the dumpster. Dave, I hope you give these questions top priority. <laughs> I will. Uh, good to know. I'll, I'll ask. Thank you. You're welcome. Martha, you have anything? No, I'm all set with that. That would be at least a $60 fee, you know, per pull on the dumpster, Mary, at least uh, a week, I would think. It's it's $50 for res residential. Yeah. So it's, you know, you got a weekly fee in there. You got, you know, I'm thinking it's not... Could be a two-yard dumpster, but I think if it's a four-yard dumpster, and they come and pull it at least weekly. So if it's sixty, you know, we're up to one eighty there um, in a hurry. So I think that, you know, I'm I'm thinking that that's not too far off. Okay. So I'll double check, anyways. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I think we're ready to move on. So everyone's going to stop by and sign the liquor licenses, right? Yes. And and, uh, and the and fire the warden. And the fire warden. Okay. So the next thing, uh, the local emergency management plan. What do we have to do with that? You have to correct the spelling for one thing, right? The top line is Harland, town of Harland. Yeah. Hey, so Dave, the emergency management plan, how did you decide which um which select people got put on there? <laughs> so, I bumped you down one. So, Matt Peeler, I could no longer keep on there. So, you became an easy uh you became an easy switch. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> I was reading it and I was like, how am I on this? Dave, and I appreciate you're having the wrong phone numbers for me, so I'm all I'm all set. <laughs> <laughs> so Phil, I think that happened last year. What um what's the um the, the cell is correct, but the landline is two five nine one, wherever it is. Hold on just a moment. Let me find you. Uh, I've got 2104. What is, what is it? Uh, 2591. 2591? Yeah. Um, so I did have a question about the shelters, the primary and local shelters. They both have this notes section that, for instance, has generator and pets allowed, yes or no, and neither yes nor no are circled on both of them. Um, <coughs> Yeah, thanks for pointing that out, uh, um, Curtis. I'll have to, uh, I'll circle those. I was in a little bit of a rush. I literally did this, like, a, you know, I try and get your packets out by early afternoon on Thursday. And I was pulling this together on um, Thursday morning, uh, some of the final things on it. So you're right, I didn't circle it, but um, on, the, on the primary shelter, on the one that would be the Red Cross uh, out of Hartford, uh, that would have a generator um, questionable on the pets. Uh, on the alternate local shelter, and notice the sometimes in bold, uh, because they kind of got away from doing it uh, at the end of, we didn't really have a need this winter, the, the winter before, Towards the end of it, I don't think Lucia was um, overly keen on it. 
Um, but that's a sometimes um, when the need arose um, and if they had the ability to open, they would. Uh, so that is a sometimes um, with the primary really being if it's a true uh, regional event um, that the American Red Cross would see something fit to open, they would, and that's, that's the primary shelter. Uh, and that would have the generator. The, the church does not. And, and therein lies the problem on a local level, um, whether it be here in Damon Hall or the churches or, or anywhere else. Um, none, not one of those locations has a generator. So thank you, Curtis, for pointing that out. And Mary, um, I will just put the T on there because that's the page that actually gets submitted. <laughs> um, so uh, that'll be good to make sure that that says Heartland. Looks like I need to sign that, Dave. Uh, yeah, when you're in, if you could, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, they actually said on this one we could just submit it due to the whole um, webinars, but if you're coming in, we'll have you sign it and we'll make it official. Okay. okay, I think I'll be in tomorrow. Okay. Do we need to accept it as a board or anything? Uh, you should make a motion to uh, so it's in the minutes. Okay, I move to accept the local emergency management plan updated on April 20th, so possibly updated tomorrow on the 21st, Dave. Um, you can... I mean, I got to make some small tweaks, but um, if you want to just go with the 20th because that's the date that you're approving it, I think that'll be fine. Okay. I make a motion to accept the local emergency management plan updated on April 20th, 2020, with the couple minor changes as described in this meeting. Okay. I'll second the motion. Good. Everybody in favor of this plan? Yep. yep. Yes. 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 Good. Okay. So we're passed. Good. Bell it down to manager's notes, Dave. Did we need to do anything for the liquor licenses or just come in individually and sign them? That's right. You should, yeah. Yep. Okay. That's all you have to do. Uh, well, you should, uh, in the past, we've always made it. You should make a motion and put it in the minutes. Uh, that uh, yeah, Last right. year, we did a, last year, you did a joint motion that you approved all three. Oh. Okay. Uh, you should, you should do the same. Dave, do you know why, why this tavern has like, three different? Yeah. Licenses. You know why that is? Uh, which one is it? It's called Call of Tavern. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that um, they may have a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I want to say banquet, but uh, uh, catering. Catering uh, would be one, the bar would be another. I think I know the third one is outdoors. Their outdoors seating is a separate license. And I think the I think the second one is just including the information they just wrote by hand on the first one. It includes it typed out. Everything else was identical as far as I could see. But there was a difference between two of them and the third one. And the third one was for their outdoor seating that abuts the church. Well, I didn't know they had any outdoors, but I guess they might on occasion. Right. When we, yeah, we had a, an event there one time. I think it was a funeral. So that's probably it, yeah. Yeah, they have to stay 200 feet away from the church, according to regulations. <clears throat> okay. Dave, you got any comments on your manager's um, report? Uh, I, nope. I do think we need a motion on the, the liquor license. Oh, well. yeah. 
Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Yep, it's okay. So we're looking for a motion then. Last year, I think you made a motion to accept uh, or approve. You made a motion to approve, um, and then you, you listed the three Skunk Hollow Tavern, Bee Gees, and Mike's Deli, I believe. Okay, I'll make that motion. I think it's called Mike's Store and Collectibles. It is. Yeah. So I'll make the motion that the board approve the liquor licenses, approve liquor licenses for. Mike's Store and Collectibles, Skunkalo Tavern, and Bee Gees Market. Second. Uh, I'll second it. Okay. So everybody in favor of that? Yep. Yes. Good. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. All right. Now we can move on. Bill, I was hoping we'd see your son this week. We saw him two weeks ago, and I see him back there. Again, just, just, just arrived. Okay. Wait, who, uh, excuse me. Who seconded that liquor license motion? Bill. Bill. Thank you. Uh, while we're doing motions, do we want to um, we want to uh, accept the accounts payable? We did last week. Does that include the, that's the warrants? No, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. <sighs> Dave, you want to, you want a motion on that? Uh, yeah, I think that um, this solidifies it. <clears throat> so. I move to accept the accounts payable um, for invoices up to for April 20th, 2020. That's good. I'll, I'll second that. Everybody's good with that? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. That's done. All right. Okay. Manage's notes. So Three Corners Intersection uh, is back in the conversation uh, and we got detailed cost estimates from the engineer on this. Uh, so the numbers that you have in your written report uh, are, are just for the utilities above and beyond the um, projected cost of the underlying project. So for the complete burial, uh, the estimated project uh, cost is $510,000. I believe that includes a contingency. And for the option number two, pushing the telephone pole from the intersection towards the bank, kind of above the retaining wall, uh, where there's kind of a cluster of trees, um, and letting the the utilities that run north to south only stay aerial and the rest gets buried. The price tag on that was 373,000. So there is a price difference, um, I wanna say 120,000 or somewhere in there. I did the math um, last week. Uh, and there are some distinctive pros and cons to this. Uh, and we can get into this um, at another select board meeting when we talk, look at the drawings um, a little bit more in detail. Uh, but I, what I did wanna tell you is, is put out some numbers for you and just to put it back on our time schedule that we, we've been talking about putting this to the voters. So this is what we've been waiting for. We've been waiting for these numbers to put to the voters. I think it's a, a really depends on, uh, we've been looking at August, uh, the, the primary vote and what we can and can't do in August for that. But um, it is time that we kind of turn the corner on this and look towards putting this to the voters for an up or down. Uh, it'll also give us a little bit clearer vision as when we putting the actual project together for the bike ped grant, uh, what that's going to entail. But um, again, I wanted to give you the numbers and put this back in front of you. It is moving forward and we're gonna need to kind of lift this and carry it to 
uh, a town vote in the not too distant future here. Uh, second thing of importance uh, in the highway department is the Mace Hill Culvert project. Um, that's moving along. We have a bid opening on the bids um, April 30th. This is, uh, again, I'm hoping that as we move towards summertime, this kind of relaxes uh, and that some of these open projects or more essential projects are allowed to go forward. <clears throat> However, uh, they have put a hold on these FEMA projects and it may be a combination of, we don't want these people out there and getting sick, but there's also a state grant aspect to this. And again, the state is hurting financially. So they also may be looking for excuses to cut back on the grant payouts, tough to say, but at the moment, uh, if it were today, this project would be on hold. Uh, the fact that it's supposed to happen towards Labor Day, hopefully things open up and we can proceed. Finances, uh, kind of the same, uh, similar story. Uh, we talked about a little bit on the delinquencies. Um, I think the important message here is that Cheryl Perry, our treasurer, for a bit felt uncomfortable with um, her relationship and communication with the school and the school finance department. She was hoping that she could relinquish her school duties and kind of continue with the town. Unfortunately, statutorily, it doesn't work that way. Um, she would have had to relinquish both. So she is um, giving that some second thoughts. I hope that she continues. And I have spoken to uh, Nikki Buck, uh, the chair for the school, uh, David Baker, the superintendent, and Ed Connors, the finance person over there. And I think we've got some ways to um, make that communication better, make her more feel more comfortable. Um, I hope to keep her moving forward and keep that going as well. Dave, uh, I saw somewhere um, in the last week or two that there was a uh, it implied that Ed, Ed Connors was leaving that, his position. Could that possibly be happy news? I mean, I mean, sorry. <laughs> uh. um, I would, uh, so I'll say two things. Um, so um, Ed is, um, you need to work at uh, communication with Ed and, um, you know, get to a point where, um, you've got a good working relationship. Ed does know, you know, what's going on and he's been good for the finances. So um, I have not heard that he is moving on. And in my discussion with him, I did not get that impression from any one of the three. Okay. So um, I, that remains to be, remains to be seen. Okay. I'll try to sort of remember where I read that. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Local hazard mitigation plan uh, is a bigger macro piece of paper than um, what we just passed. Uh, we have put together a group for that. Uh, they meet May 6th, I think it is, May 5th or 6th. I think it's May 6th. Kind of doing this off the top of my head. We've got about 10, 11 people um, if everybody um, sticks with it. Uh, Mary is involved in that. She was involved in that last time, um, along with most of the town folks that are involved with uh, an emergency response, being fire department, rescue, highway, constable, um, you know, kind of together as a group. And um, we'll move forward on that. Hopefully put it into place and, and um, have no hiccups there. Uh, that's about it. Oh, no, oh, oh, oh. One important topic. Uh, we have talked about Woodstock, the town of Woodstock in the past and what they did to our ambulance budget. If you recall, we were paying about 15800 They sent us a letter saying, no, we want about 33000 uh, So we looked very seriously at um, moving to Windsor to pick up that slack. Uh, and Windsor seemed to be willing to do that. Uh, however, um, 
We have agreed with Woodstock that an amount of 21,000 would be an acceptable amount. Uh, it is still a decent increase, um, although not the 32, 33,000 that they were looking for. But at the end of the day, uh, it keeps that response intact, um, keeps Windsor from going all the way down Route 12. And um, also maintains what I think is important is the goodwill relationship um, between Heartland and Woodstock. Um, because in the couple of conversations that I had with them, um, it could have spiraled downwards um, uh, a little bit more. We do have essentially mutual aid agreements with them for highway department. Uh, we take care of Dens uh, Densmore all the way to the Woodstock town line. There's several other roads involved. Um, Morley Road is also involved. So um, we reached the depths of that conversation um, before we found our way to this. So um, I think it is a decent compromise, um, even though it is more than what we paid a Hartford or Windsor. But um, I, think it's, uh, I think it moves us in the right direction. Well, Dave, I, I mean, shouldn't they be worried about their relationship with yeah. us? It's more It's more than 33% in increase. That's well, highly they, robbery. They proposed doubling it. Yeah, like, yeah. That's ridiculous. You think the relationship could have broken down. That letter seems like a sign of the relationship breaking down with a hammer, <laughs> sledgehammer. Um, I think it's important to look at Woodstock as a whole and not just maybe just one entity of Woodstock. Um, and I would uh, also question, um, and I'll say this on record, um, <laughs> knowing that the uh, Vermont Standard uh, is interested in this conversation, but um, okay. um, I think that um, uh, I don't think it was handled very well. Um, and I think that um, that's been a voice to them. I think that getting this news on January 7th or 8th is not um, valid. But nevertheless, um, we do have ambulatory service in that sector of town. Windsor could have uh, picked it up. They can still pick it up uh, in the future. Uh, however, it is a closer ride for Woodstock. Um, and again, um, I think that this was a number that, at the end of the day, serves us both. Thanks, Dave. Um, Dave, I had a question about the highway. Yep. So I, I think it was perfectly reasonable with an abundance of caution to switch to the three employees per shift and rotating um, the three-person crews every other week. I'm I'm wondering at at one point at what point in time do we think about relaxing any of that and maybe one of the first routes we can do is not combining the crews but instead allowing them to work simultaneously as long as they're not accessing the same buildings like the highway building or something at the same time. What are your thoughts on that? So, um, and this has been interesting conversation has been coming down from the uh, state of Vermont. So we're not even really supposed to be doing anything other than emergency maintenance anyways. Um, however, they just recently stuck a sentence in there that allows us to do grading. So they don't even want us out there. You know, the original message that came down from the state of Vermont was, you know, park you guys at home and leave the roads until, you know, May 15th. Um, except unless you have, you know, potholes that are going to, you know, cause a danger to the public, you know, or you have a culvert that has clogged up and is causing a danger to the public, then you can send your crew out to take care of that. Um, the obvious thing to that is, is, well, if you don't grade for, you know, four to five weeks in mud season, Every other day, you're going to be pulling your crew out to go send them out to smooth over the, the, the um, potholes. So at the end of the day, we're not too far off um, what we can and can't do. And um, they still want the towns to be separating these crews and to make sure that they are doing what they should be doing to, um, you know, 
next best thing to the stay at home order. Same thing as if you were to go to the grocery store, that's what they want the, the crew to do. So other towns have done things similar. And I think that um, unfortunately we will probably follow suit until we hear further guidance from the state of Vermont, whether that be before May 15th or at May 15th. Right now it's been loosened up. You can have one or two people, contractors out there I think I said, I'm not sure if I said this, but you know, this morning, you know, a crew of five pulled up across the street, the landscape, you know, I just had to kind of chuckle, um, you know, that's kind of what's going on, but um, we're doing our part and uh, we'll continue to do that. Thanks. So Dave, Dave, how about the um, steps? Why wouldn't they get done? That's just one person, isn't it? No, it's uh, it's it's um, not just one person. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. Um, and again, you know, until today, um, that was all on hold. But um, you know, the the whole schedule of contractors at the moment is kind of out of whack. So if you wanted to start something, you know, March twentieth or April fourth. Um, depending on who you were or, what, or not, or what you were doing, a good chance you couldn't start that work. Not to mention the supply chain and a lot of this stuff um, as to what you're getting or, or what it is you need or, or where that's coming from, their ability to deliver or not deliver. So um, things are just not normal at the moment. Okay, does anybody have anything else? Hey, Just Dave, can I throw a question at you? Uh, who is that? Hey, Dave, what, what's the status on Depot Road? Is this James? Yes. So last I knew, uh, Depot Road was a go and um, they seem to be very much in, in go status. We had a pre preliminary meeting on that. Um, I believe as of April 15th, they were going to start putting signage up over there for that project. Now, I haven't been over there in the last they week or so. Parking the road in the last week. I noticed that spray where, they where, where signs were going. They, what did they do? They swept. They were spray painting where the signs were going. Okay. So it sounds as if they're still moving forward. And that was okay. to start May 1st, go through little October 15th and not, um, and they were still going to use the pike pit. Okay. Dave, I didn't know if you could provide us any additional information on any of the court proceedings that are going on. Uh, no news as of yet. Okay. Um, no news on the um, no news on the Supreme Court um, argument, and there was a property tax appeal that was dropped. Correct. Right. Thank you. Could I ask about um, the two people that are have joined us by phone? One is Neil Allen, is that correct? And the second one, I don't know who that is. I only I only see one, Martha. Oh, there are two. Eight five four nine and two zero three four. If you're muted, you need to press star six to unmute, Dave. Is that right? Yes. Two zero three four is your constable. Oh, thank you. Okay, I'm all set then. Okay. Sorry, Martha. I see his. I saw his. I see his name and not a phone number. Oh. I see his phone number and not a name. <laughs> Technology. All 
Well, anything else? That's all I got. Lined it up. That's been a good meeting. Everything went well, I guess. Gordon, Dave, it? thank you very much for all you're doing to stay the course and keep going, holding us together. I'll point out your trash, but I think it's just the one dumpster coming out of the highway garage. That's a lot of money for trash, Dave. But we pull all the buildings, all the buildings trash goes to the one. So, and again, the library is not open, but uh, usually we'll pull Damon Hall's trash, bring it over there. We'll pull um, the library's trash, pull it over there. Um, I might have to do a waste audit. Okay. <laughs> Everyone has their pet projects. <laughs> well, I'll have to make sure I don't have any identifiable trash in there. <laughs> That's right, especially if they're supposed to be recycled. Do you guys do you guys tra do you guys tax the haulers? Yeah. You do? <clears throat> yeah. So there's like a there's a there's a surcharge on the, the tonnage that they pick up. Okay. Out, of the, out of each district. In uh, the Southern Windsor district, it's only $7 a ton. In GUV, it's quite a bit more, but I, I don't know off the top of my head how much it is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I add something that goes <laughs> just really quickly that goes back to the roads planning group, or is that going to be a giant no-no? That's quick. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how long is it? <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully very quick, uh, maybe just something to think about. Um, and in response to Mary's thoughts about uh, how it's going to impact the tax base, I wonder if there might be any ways of, um, of having it affect different parts of the tax base um, at different rates. So for instance, I could see something like we own a multifamily home and having a multifamily home means that we use the roads more often our property uses the road more often. Um, so I wonder if there's some sort of structure like that that might distribute the tax increases in a more equitable way. It just not anything to like debate or anything, but if people think about it or- You'd have to take that up with your legislators. Oh, okay. I And, <laughs> and nothing to say about it at all. <laughs> it's an interesting it? thought. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, guys. That's all I got. Yep. Okay. Thanks. See you tomorrow. Have a good night. Yo, Dave, how do we sign these documents? Do we get to the parking lot and knock on the door? or? Multiple we'll, uh, people are now exiting. We'll, we'll let you in. Um, we'll let you in to sign it. Okay. I heard it here today. <laughs> Should we come to the front door or the back door? Uh, come to the front door, uh, okay. and either Martin or Clyde will have the info. Okay. And uh, you know, I don't think we signed it right last time, so it's probably just as well uh, that Clyde's there to show you where to sign. Um, so you get all those sheets that need to be signed. So you'll probably need to actually come physically in and, and do it. So come to the front door. Okay. 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 Will do. Very good. Well, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.